sessions are recorded and all the all the documents from the sessions and everything are going to be distributed afterwards. So as I was saying, the conversion science session is going to be probably in January. Uh, we need to schedule it uh, because, you know, there's a lot of now <laughs> holidays happening and also different uh, main conference. So just uh, stay tuned. We'll probably send an email uh, soon after this. So, um, yep, I think I'm just passing this over Christo that he will introduce the super amazing <laughs> um, panelists that we have today. And yep. Thank you, Anna. And uh, thanks everyone <clears throat> for joining our fifth session. Again, it's a pleasure to have a wide range of speakers and panelists today that will let us know about all uh, complex issues of writing a good, broader impact and uh, re research relevant statements. Uh, so what we'll do here is to give each of these speakers uh, two minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, we have um, Steve Nesbitt from um, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He is a professor and director of graduate studies there. We have Megan Myron Carrolls, uh, who is a recruiter and a DEI lead at UCAR. And uh, finally, we have Karen Slater, who is a writer and an editor in NCAR. And so, Steve, why don't you go ahead and maybe for two minutes introduce yourselves, and I'll pass it over to Megan after. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, if you go forward in the slides, I have a, a little slide that talks a little bit about, uh, there you go. So, um, so my name is Steve Nesbitt. I'm a professor here at the University of Illinois on the other side of the Great Plains from UCAR. Uh, but uh, I've been here for gosh 17 years now and uh been through been through and um, um, through the postdoc process at colorado state and then becoming a professor being mentored through the grant writing process and now serving as the mentor for new faculty in our department including underrepresented uh, uh, faculty so um, hopefully i can provide some uh, wise wisdom here for you all um, I also do a lot of observational uh, work, and, and I've been involved in now 24 field campaigns uh, on four different continents. Uh, so um, that has also uh, been a learning process and process and writing the, writing the project, project. I don't even want to count how many proposals I've written for all these projects. Um, um, a little bit about myself. Um, I like being outdoors and uh, uh, have a, I have three kids and my partner in crime and I... Uh, uh, try to have fun out here in Illinois. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. Um, Megan? Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Megan Myron Carls, or Megan MK. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I am in my 11th or so month working here at UCAR. Um, I have a bit of an untraditional background. Um, I went to school and got my degrees, my, my undergraduate and graduate degrees in sociology and then um, spent about almost a decade working in higher education, um, specifically within student affairs um, at a couple of different uh, colleges and universities, and then worked at a high school for a hot minute, and then am now here. Um, my passion area is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and helping people understand, um, understand those ideas and how they can incorporate them to create um, a richer experience uh, in their work life and their personal lives, et cetera. Um, and I'm also a parent of two small kiddos. I have a, a four-year-old and a 15-month-old, <laughs> a couple of dogs, and I live in Denver right now. And um, I'm a big soccer enthusiast. So that's a little bit about me. We'll get into it when it's my turn to present. Thank you, Megan. And I'll give the words to Karen, finally. Hi, everyone. Um, I was invited to this, and I immediately replied to the email and said, are you sure you're asking the right person? Because I don't write grants. I'm a tech editor. I love words. My Someone asked me the other day what my favorite quality about myself was, and I said, my vocabulary which was probably not what they were hoping to hear. Anyway, I love what I do for RAL and for a broader population now for the ASP postdocs is I'm a technical editor and I started that career well, mostly with environmental engineering firms. Um, 
I was part of the team that closed Rocky Flats, if you know anything about that. So that was a lot of reporting. And um, I love what I do. I love who I do it for. And I love what we do as an organization. So I am pretty impassioned about my role here. My personal life. Uh, I have an eight month old golden retriever. I live in Golden with my husband who's a career firefighter. And um, that ought to do it for you. Thank you, Karen. That's an excellent introduction for everyone. And um, Mariani, if you maybe can propagate one slide further so I can give a broad summary of today's session. We have a lot of exciting topics and uh, ground to cover here. So just as a reminder, we'll be talking about what counts as a broader impact when you're writing a grant proposal. Um, how do we balance between grand deals versus uh, mediocre uh, words and statements? Uh, how do we go about writing a meaningful and actionable DEI broader impact statements? What are the things that we need to consider? Uh, and how do we relate these aspects to uh, the technical and scientific writing that goes into the proposal? Then how do we uh, write things in an effective way to convey our really important scientific ideas? How do we convince program managers that our proposals are worth funding? And in general, uh, toward the end of the session, we'll have a nice two snippets of example statements that come from um, funded proposals that we were uh, very lucky to have access to. We'll show you uh, what these statements look like, maybe analyze them a little bit, uh, ask for your opinion, and we'll close with questions uh, for the speakers and open discussion. So on that note, I'll, uh, it's my pleasure to give the word to Steve first, who will tell us a little bit about writing broader impacts and DEI statements in proposals. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Risto. And uh, I'm glad we have such a diverse panel because they all provide really important expertise in terms of crafting these kind of statements. And uh, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, it's not just about sort of the technical aspects of your proposal, but also the style and the presentation of what goes into it. So, so these are all things to sort of develop, to sort of develop sort of as you move on, as you move on to the world of writing proposals. So I'll just start out very briefly, you know, through the series, hopefully you understand, you know, why we write proposals. Obviously, it's it's to support your research. Um, but as um, sort of time goes on here, it becomes more important that we need to not only explain the technical aspects of our work, but also we need to make sure the work is relevant to uh, the broader groups of people out there. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then also uh, make sure that we are that we are the workforce developing um, the capacity of research within the country within the world and we need to demonstrate that uh, through our proposals and so today we're talking about two important aspects here uh, the relevance uh, which we'll, we'll get into in, in terms of being more specific and then also the broader impacts uh, of your research and of course, you know, we want to be able to get funded. And so uh, it's worth a lot of time uh, preparing these proposals and and, uh, and making sure that they stand out when they're valued and they're valued and they buy, who buy, who buy those. Um, so really, it's almost just as much about, you know, getting all the technical aspects, like, you know, but also making sure that when it comes down to making the decision, uh, you know, whoever's doing it, the review panel, the program manager or whoever, you want to make sure that you're rising above that sort of cutoff line, right? And that takes, uh, that that's where you get style points, right? So uh, we'll go to the next slide now. Um, so we'll start out talking about relevance here. And uh, the, the, just wanna, I just want to share, share what I call the first rule of writing proposals. Uh, and that is treat your reviewers nicely and make it easy for them uh, to evaluate your proposal. And, you know, we all hear about reviewer two uh, being sort of, uh, keep in mind reviewer two is just like you going through challenges uh, and making uh, life, you know, easy for them to find what's in your proposal 
uh, navigate through and actually fill out the evaluation forms that each agent that each agent that each proposal proposal. I want, to make, I want to make it simple as possible for them to copy Steve? and paste. Yes. Steve, your audio is going in and out. Would you okay. mind exiting the meeting and then coming back in to see if that will reset it? Sure. Let me try something else. Yeah, let me let me do that. Okay. So we can look at a picture of a cute cat while we wait for him. <laughs> It's a sleepy cat, which is perfect for a snowy day here in Boulder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so just a reminder, keep posting uh, your questions if you have them in the Q&A um, section in, um, in Slido. And then, yeah, and also you can vote other questions and then just propagate them like to the top and then we can read them at the end and discuss them with all of us. Let's see, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah, we can hear you so far, it's good. Okay. Okay. All right, all right. So it's important to remember this uh, first rule of uh, proposal writing. And let me try this too. There we go. All right. So, um, so make it easy. My main point here is make it as easy as possible to uh, review your proposal, and and this is important for broader impacts and relevance as well. Um, so, uh, we'll go to the next slide here. Um, so, in terms of relevance here, um, before I get started talking about relevance, we need to, of course, understand what relevance means to each pertains to each pertains to be applying might be applying. Um, um, first of all, if you happen to be applying to a NASA grant, okay, NASA has three boxes that reviewers have to fill out. And, and the second one usually is relevance to NASA. So if you're writing a proposal to NASA, this is a critical piece of information that you need to include. And, and what relevance means to NASA is very specific. It means, does it fit within the purview of what NASA does? Okay, so that's kind of a specific thing for NASA that you need to, to definitely argue and, and argue and, and argue sort of by, sort of by NASA and asking through things like the decadal survey, which sort of guides what all NASA does and also talks about the different missions that NASA does. And you need to specifically call out where you fit within that in terms of relevance. Now for the other funding agencies, relevance is a little bit less specific and they're basically, for example, for NSF or DOE, you basically need to explain why your proposal fits within the given agency uh, that um, they expect the prospect the prospect of sort of in sort of. So, I mean, for example, if you're applying to the Climate and Large Scale Dynamics Program at NSF, you probably don't want to propose something about supercells um, because unless it's really a climate issue that you're talking about, right? So so really, in order to spell it out, you need to make sure that you fit within the purview of, of each program. Um, so make sure that you understand how relevance is evaluated within the proposal. And we'll talk about some tips for how to do that in a minute here. But also know the agency culture. Talk to your cop, talk to your cop, talk and, and so that they can tell you how that works. Uh, and then also in terms of relevance, budget also comes into that too, because you want to make sure that that what you're proposing is sort of the expected amount of money that they expect you to request, right? A lot of proposals are rejected because they're too expensive. So in order to be relevant, you have to also kind of fit within the budgetary scope of what they, they expect. Um, but how do you learn how to do this? Well, it comes a little bit with experience, but it also comes by looking at other proposals. And we'll talk about that and talk about that and talk about uh, 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 So learning how to demonstrate relevance of your proposal. So how do you actually gain the expertise? Um, well, the first thing, which I call the, the zero order thing, is make sure you read the guidelines for the proposal. They will usually spell out exactly what they want in terms of relevance. And so even though those documents can be long and arduous, it's important to read those documents 
And then also each year they update those documents. And so you want to make sure that you're getting the latest information, 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 the agent, the agent is to learn the lay of the land in your funding agency that you're applying for. And as early career scientists, this means going to meetings, kind of going to talks relevant to that specific agency, that specific program. Uh, talk to your colleagues uh, at NCAR. There's a lot of experience in terms of different agencies. So find those people and talk to them. You know, take them out to lunch. Uh, try to understand kind of what they think about different agencies and what might sell and what might not sell in terms of relevance. Um, number two, talk to, talk to, okay, they, okay, they, people, people, they're scientists. I've had very long phone conversations with program managers. They're happy to help you guys uh, get started. So, so don't be afraid. They, they're not evil people. You know, they want to meet you guys and learn uh, what you're doing uh, and try to help you get, be successful. Uh, number three, look at successful programs, uh, sorry, successful proposals, you know, call people up and, or send them a message and say, Hey, do you mind if I take a look at your proposal? You know, I promise not to, to share it with anyone, 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 Tina is Tina is Tina is, is important to learn kind of what they, what they do. And number four, if possible, volunteer to review proposals either on like a red team within the organization there at NCAR or uh, serve on review panels and review, uh, I'm sorry, program managers are happy to have volunteers to help review proposals. They, they're usually searching for people to do this. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's also is how I learned a lot about looking at proposals and seeing what sold and what didn't, uh, kind of looking at them side by side, side by side, side. Okay, now we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about broader impacts. So here, this is something that can take many forms within a proposal. Uh, and I've got some pictures there from some things that I have done in the past, but this is by no means the exhaustive list of what you can do in terms of demonstrating broader impacts in your proposals. Um, one can be student training, okay? and. Student training is something you usually do, you know, as a faculty member, faculty member, faculty and said students said do right, right golf every morning and you know, they do all the work. I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, the students are the people that are in trained within within the research and they're training and demonstrating that you're reaching a broad and diverse group of students through that training process is usually going to give you a lot of high marks in terms of scoring and broader impacts. Um, other things that we do, uh, which we do, of course, at NCAR, UCAR, but also at the university, is public outreach. So here we take the results of our research or our process of doing process of doing process case of the case of campaign, campaign, show it off. We show it to the public through direct outreach events, through uh, putting things on the web, through having webinars, through visiting different community groups. These are things that are part of the process that we that we often do in terms of doing uh, broader impacts in terms of public outreach. Um, third one is formal education. So here we, we say we're going to develop a curriculum that will be delivered to some organization. So for example, we're going to develop like we're going to develop like we're going to curriculum per curriculum per curriculum, something like that. Generally, something this this is something that's related to the research topic, and you probably don't want to go too far afield if you're doing this. And we'll talk about why in a minute. But here, here you are developing formal curriculum. Now, none of us probably are K through twelve educators, so when we start talking about formal education, we also have to develop a way to evaluate and make sure that what we're doing is following guidelines for K through 12 education, let's say, right? So that might, and that might, and that involves an out, involves an out, involves, uh, evaluate that. And of course you would want to involve those people in the proposal. Preferably you want to pay those people to be involved in the proposal as well. And then finally there's informal education. So here we're going to go out and say, we're going to develop uh, things that will have educational components to them, but then will not necessarily be evaluated or in, included into a direct curriculum 
exercise. So here we might you know, go out and demonstrate in the school that we're going to launch a radio sound. We might you know, take our radar, take our radar, take our school, school probably that are underrepresented or might not have access to the kinds of technologies that we usually use. But, you know, you want to demonstrate through that process that you're having an impact as well. So these are some, but not an exhaustive list of broader impacts that you might do. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of writing broader impacts into your proposals, uh, this is very, again, very proposal and program dependent. Um, some programs, like some of you, some of you, some of you writing an NS writing an NS writing. This has a large component of broader impact that you will have to spend a lot of time on and probably have a formal education component and most likely. So this is something that you'll you'll want to spend a lot of time on. You want to reach out and use the resources that you have in your organization to to help that. NSF always evaluates proposals uh, in terms of their broader impacts. And, and so that will range a lot depending on your, your research and, and your proposal. And the scope of that will vary accordingly. Sometimes it's just training graduate students, graduate students, grad students, students, right? right? If you're an early career research, you can demonstrate that doing the research will have impact on you as a, as a human resource. Um, but in NSF, they will be evaluating your broader impacts as a major component. Um, the other programs, it really depends more on the program. Uh, the Early Career Grant at NASA has a broader impacts component, but most other NASA proposals, it's sort of an implicit part of the proposal, and it's kind of like icing on the cake, if you will. Uh, you probably want to have it in there, have it in there, have it isn't doesn't a huge component of the research proposal. Um, other programs are sort of evolving. You know, DO, D, DOE is now going to be having an impact and a, and a Jedi type statement within their proposals. And so this is something we need to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of the scope, again, uh, of broader impacts, this can take many forms and, and increasingly is intersecting with Jedi type themes in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, but you will want, you will want kind of, kind of up in, up in leveraging your research to do outreach and broader impacts. Um, you want to be able to demonstrate the impact of what you're doing. You want to show that it's um, targeting either groups of individuals or institutions or geographies that generally don't, you know, would have a positive impact from this kind of work. Uh, and uh, of course, you you may or may not have a very close connection between the broader impacts and your research, uh, or it may be more kind of separate. Um, and that's fine, fine, fine. Slide, I'll say, slide, I'll say, limit, limit. Um, so if we can go to that next slide, please. So you have to consider several things when you're designing a successful sort of broader impacts part of your proposal. Um, you have to know kind of who's going to be reviewing it. So know who, who might say yes or no. Um, kind of envision your panel. Is your panel going to be your peers or is it going to be a very diverse group that's evaluating things for education uh, and maybe more uh, expecting different different further or further or aspect. Um, and also consider whether your, your sort of broader impacts are very integrated in the proposal or an add-on. And that's going to kind of say the scope. Do you need to bring in an evaluator? Do you need to bring in an educator? Uh, those are important things. Um, number two, seek additional resources. Talk to your colleagues and, and your institutional resources. Um, these people will help you uh, with this parse process. And I know at NCAR, there, if you're writing proposals, there's great resources um, uh, that that help, uh, like within the ASP program, to help uh, a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, expertise and community needs. Make sure that you know kind of what you're doing. Um, don't try to go out and propose something that people are going to say, hey, you know, Professor Nesbitt does, you know, observations, but now he's going to develop a tool for modeling. You know, that's ridiculous. So make sure that you're focusing on things that you're going to succeed and make sure it's something that you anticipate people needing 
as well. Um, be careful also to differentiate broader impacts with broadening participation. Okay, these are both important, both important, both, uh, but they're, uh, but they're, uh, can be the impact of your scientific work on people or the community, whereas broadening participation is bringing in groups that uh, may be underrepresented and, and, and so forth. So, so make sure that you're differentiating those things when you're talking about these broadening topics. Uh, and then, of course, um, again, emphasizing know your audience. Spell out the benefits, novelty, or detailed plan, your qualifications, and the resources able to carry out the broader impacts of your proposal. And, and you have to, you have to six, six, so this is where evaluation comes in, either informal or formal, uh, so that uh, the reviewers can believe that your, your broader impacts efforts are going to have a measured and positive impact. So I'll wrap up there, and, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Steve, for a very comprehensive look at the different aspects that go into broader impacts and different opportunities that uh, we can take to make this really meaningful and to align well with what the uh, particular solicitation is asking for. I like how we mentioned that there are certain things that we should be mindful of, uh, for example, Jedi-related topics and how to leverage. Uh, maybe sometimes we have opportunity to propose uh, things that may be not immediately clear uh, so we need to be very careful evaluating this one at a time. Now, in the interest of time, I will switch to Megan. There were two specific questions for you, Steve, and we'll read them at the end uh, after all the speakers have an opportunity to speak. Thank you so much again, and we expect to see you in a little bit again. Hey, y'all, me again. Uh, here's a picture of my family because I think they're adorable. Um, <laughs> But again, my name is Megan Myron Carls or Megan MK. My last job, I worked at a high school and we all went by our last names. And so for six years of my life, I was referred to as MK and it, I, it, it, took, it took for me, I really like it. So I wanna extend that opportunity to you to use, for you to use that as well. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, those are my kiddos, Merrick and Kennedy. We call, uh, my oldest is, is Kennedy. We call her Eddie after my grandpa. Um, and that's my wife, Kelsey. Um, and yeah um if if there's any soccer fans out there just know that you've got a friend in me especially if you follow uh, women's soccer um i'll put that out there and i'm a sociologist by by like academic training and so i really i geek out on having conversations around specifically identity development and how how our identities are influenced and affected by one another and in systems of, of power privilege and oppression um, and so if at any point um, you have a question about what I'm, what I'm talking about or you need more clarification, please just put something in the chat or interrupt me. I'm cool with it. Uh, but yeah, feel free to move on to the, the next slide. Um, I wanted to, to first jump into the conversation around like what, what, what are these words that we use a lot? Um, in, my, in my lived experience, Oftentimes, when people say the word diversity, what they're, what they're, what, what I hear them say and how they talk about diversity is really race and ethnicity. Um, maybe they're, they're talking about both those two ideas as well as maybe gender. Um, but rarely is it this concept of all of the things that make you, you, right? So your political beliefs, your family makeup, um, your age your mental and physical ability, um, your income bracket, right? Like there's, there's just way more that goes into this word for me personally. Um, but I feel like a lot of times when, when we talk about diversity, it, it gets very much um, pigeonholed into talking specifically um, around race and ethnicity, maybe gender, um, so on and so forth. Apologies if you can hear my dogs barking in the background. Okay, great. Um, when, when, when we talk about equity, um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. When, when I'm talking about equity, and hopefully when you talk about equity moving forward, um, I, wanna, I want us to think about it in the terms of what makes something fair and just, not just like making sure we all have an opportunity or access to this thing, um, but what kind of accommodations might somebody need in order to access the material. So like, not just verbally saying something out loud, but maybe providing some visual aids 
Um, granted, like when we're talking about writing a, a, a proposal for research or for, for money for grants, um, that's not always doable, but just something to be thinking about in general. Um, an example of equity, right? Like making sure everybody has what they need to be successful. And then lastly, for inclusion, um, I, I look at an inclusion as being equity in action. Um, it's one thing to cognitively and, and theoretically understand these concepts, but it's an entirely different thing for us to put it into, into actionable items. Um, so yeah, uh, I wanted to just like frame the conversation in, in this lens um, and, and move us beyond a bit more. So at, at, like I said earlier, I've been working here for a little over 11 months now, so I'm relatively new to the organization. Um, but part of part of my role as the diversity, equity, and inclusion lead is to um, serve as a bit of a bridge between the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and uh, human resources. And so I, I spend a lot of my day thinking about who's missing from the conversation. How could we phrase things differently to make to better articulate what we're looking for when we're posting positions? Um, and and how are we how are we asking? What are we asking candidates to provide us so that when we're reviewing their materials, we have a, a, a solid understanding of, of who they are, what their experiences have been, and what they would potentially bring to the table. Um, so when you put this in the context of, of incorporating DEI in your, in your um, research proposals, your grant applications, et cetera, um, I want us to be thinking about the fact that this is oh sorry you can move on to the next slide um this is more than just a box that we're going to check off right it's not just like a okay cool I, I talked about this one thing that counts as dei and now we get to move on dei is really it, it needs to be thought of in my opinion um as really embedded and in, and in, in woven throughout the entire process um and so for, for me, again, um, I like to think of like central questions that come back to if, when I'm when I'm putting something together um, to help myself be be centered and grounded in in this mindset of actionable. Like, how am I making sure that my values? Like, I want people to feel welcome and included and a part of the community and um, appreciated for what they're bringing to the table. And I want my work to to demonstrate that. And so I, I if I feel myself getting stuck. I'll ask myself this question, these questions. Um, so what parts of my own experiences are not currently widely recognized or represented in the work that I'm doing? Like basically, is there something about what I'm bringing to the table that is potentially unique, underrepresented, um, should be hi highlighted or lifted um, or pulled out and, and, and have a light, well, yeah, highlighted, I guess. <laughs> That's a good way to say that. Um, what other identities or context might be missing that could add richness or depth or value um, to to the work that I'm doing? Um, additionally, what communities might be affected by the work that I'm doing? Uh, and then lastly, how is my growth reflected in my research? And I think that this last piece, honestly, is hopefully going to be the, the thing that ties it all together for folks, especially when you think of inclusion statements. Um, if that's something that you're being asked to, to write, um, as a part of your, your process, what we're looking for when we ask candidates, for example, to write an inclusion statement is we're looking for growth. Like, where did you start? What things have you, have you done in your past? And how has that affected the work that you're doing now? Um, and it's very, it can feel very personal um, and vulnerable, and that can feel really scary and, and not it makes it feel like it, it's not, um, what's the, the phrase that I'm trying to look for here? <laughs> like when we, when we say things like, I just want to focus on, the, on, on the, the data or the facts, right? Like I want to take emotion out of it um, and be objective. I think that a lot of times DEI feels really vulnerable for folks because it, 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 it might feel like you're, you're, you're removing uh, or you're putting, too, too much of, of emotion into it um, or subjectivity into it. Uh, but really what I, I, I really do think that 
it's a value add and and something that can be interwoven because when you think of the con when you think of it coming from this perspective of if I want to if I want to increase my my work with indigenous communities for example but I'm I might not have in, I, I might not be a part of an indigenous community but I really I feel very passionate about incorporating this particular population into my research um, that's really that can feel really vulnerable, right? You're stepping into a space that that you might not be a subject matter expert, you might be passionate about it, but it feels uncomfortable because you don't want to necessarily speak for other people um, or get it wrong, so to speak. Um, and I would argue that it's it's still important work to do, and just because you don't hold that identity, perhaps, doesn't mean that you shouldn't attempt to to highlight the work um that you're doing and how it affects other communities and, and and lift up other voices in in the work that you're doing i hope that this makes sense i know i have a, a limited amount of time and so i want to make sure I, I address specific questions that folks might have um but yeah at the end of the day it's more complicated than just race or ethnicity you can interweave more parts about your your own experiences as well as other people's experiences into the work that you're doing and how you articulate it. And I'm really excited to hear from Karen and, and her wordsmithing because I think that can really be useful too. Um, and yeah, I wanna be here to help and serve as a resource. So I'm gonna stop rambling at this point. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to talk more with the rest of you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, that was a wonderful overview of what we should consider uh, when we're writing a DI step. And I particularly liked your point about the fact that we, if we're passionate about uh, including certain type of work that we don't necessarily associate ourselves, this is an important, uh, uh, this is okay to consider. And in fact, we should pursue that effort. And uh, it's one of the things I've been also uh, considering myself working with indigenous communities. I have friends who belong to certain communities and I've always been passionate to explore what connections we can make. And it's great to hear that you encourage this type of work. Um, so I believe uh, there is, we have a little bit of time for questions and um, I'll start with, there is uh, perhaps the last question. So how, how to make sure that we address a DI in a proposal that we're not going to, um, oops, that moved up, uh, towards a white savior complex? That's a great question. Um, I think first and foremost is naming that. <laughs> like, like I, I think a lot of people are afraid to say like, to put, to name their fear of, I don't want this research to be interpreted in this way. And so if I put, and if I say it, then I run the risk of it being that thing. Um, and I would, I would argue otherwise. I would say it is imperative that you name it. Like the, the point and emphasis of my research is not in fact to be a white savior, is to not reinforce these paradigms of, of power and oppression, um, to not center my myself or my experiences in the work that I'm doing, but rather to use my 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 vantage point to uplift other voices in other communities and, and to work alongside them um, and, and to be in partnership. Um, and so here are the things that I am doing that demonstrate that. I think really, if you can make sure that you're always coming back to like, here are the actionable things, like here are the things that we're doing, or here's what this work will do for people, or this is how we will make ensure that we don't um, further harm or, or create those kinds of power um, or inequities our divisions, um, I think naming it is really important because it, it puts it out there and it allows you to see like, oh yeah, this is a thing that I named. I'm not just thinking it and feeling it, I'm putting it out in, in the forefront. Um, and that, again, it's a, it's a bit vulnerable, right? And, and it can make it feel a little bit scary because you're putting yourself out there. But I, I would argue that you would get much more support, especially from the communities that you're trying to incorporate um into be, being able to stand and network with you 
Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And um, I absolutely agree that it, it's um, it's not an easy it's not an easy uh, thing to consider, but there are ways to address that, you know, uh, especially when it's written in a proposal. There was one additional question, which was going back to your point on uh, how do we um, ev evaluate the fact that we may not be part of a certain community? I think you addressed that already somewhat. So I'll give a preference to one additional question, which is something new that maybe you didn't touch. Uh, as much in your presentation. And this question is, do you have any suggestions on how to approach actionable DEI when the research is more abstract and global in nature and less relevant to specific communities? Sure. I think just because you're not necessarily doing a deep dive in a particular community necessarily, um, but there's broader global implica implications um I, I guess i think my advice would still be similar like name like these are broader this is a a, a larger perspective um or, or or focus um that being said here's what i'm going to be doing or here's what i hope to do or here are the communities i hope to include in the conversation to ensure that you know again my work isn't only solely being centered on on one one area or one perspective i'm considering these particular variables um, to help give a broader context um i i this is a, a this is going to feel a little bit random but i was listening to a, a news article i can't remember where apologies um but it was talking about bees and and the the vibrations that bees put off and how it affects electricity and i was like wait what <laughs> that that's random, <laughs> but like the broader implications that they were that that the researchers were were discovering was that for like atmospheric science of like how electri uh, electricity affects molecules in the air, which affects clouds. And I was like, I did I sometimes regret that I only studied sociology because I I felt very confused, but like my mind was blown at like just the the trajectory that this one incident incident where a person was studying electricity or, or vibrations caused by electricity and a bee happened to get in the way and how it, it completely just affected the, the, the overall course of their project. They just derailed it, but in, a, in, in the best way possible almost. Um, and, the, and the broader implications for like the ripple effect of like, what could this mean if, if this is true and if that is true and that thing or the other. So I guess what I'm trying to say <laughs> with this really random example is, is that Again, DEI is not, it's not limited. It doesn't have to be limited, right? It can be something big and, and, and more complex. Um, and it doesn't have to be a thing that is only focused on um, one specific population or marginalized identity. Um, it can be global. It should be global, really, um, hopefully. Um, even if we are doing a deeper dive on a specific thing, we should be thinking it, thinking about problems and problem solving from multiple angles. I think that's a great summary, essentially, uh, because we don't immediately see a connection between our research and the broader uh, implications and diversity implication doesn't mean this connect connection doesn't exist. And maybe sometimes it's about doing a little bit more research and thinking more creatively about how can I possibly take my findings and help society or, or to diversify, uh, to, to make to make my research more inclusive and uh, impactful communities that may not have been included. Uh, yeah. I think the B example is a great. Uh, so you don't we we wouldn't anticipate that until uh, we see something happening in nature or we read, make connections, do research, and make these connections offline. So I think that was a great example that hopefully addresses the question. Uh, on that note, in the interest of time, we're just about, um, uh, it's time to switch to our uh, final speaker, Karen, uh, who is already here. And uh, just as a reminder, please put your questions on the Slido deck so we can uh, read them after. And as a reminder, we will have a, a separate Q&A session at the very end. Um, thank you, Karen. The virtual floor is yours. Hey, um, I'm going to run my own slideshow, and the reason is that I'm actually going to go to several other um, URLs, so I'm going to have to kind of bounce back and forth, so I apologize ahead of, 
ahead of time for what might be a rather um, saccadic view it, viewing experience. My apologies. So um, I believe I have rights to share, don't I? Sometimes you have to make me a, oh yeah, I'm not allowed to share my screen. Okay, I think you have to make me a, that right please. now. Sorry about okay. that. <clears throat> no worries. I now forgot to mention good. that. <clears throat> Yay. Sounds like I can do this now. All right. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> Can everyone see that? Looks good on our end. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> of course, now I can't see you. Um, who am I and why am I here? Um, as you know, I work for RAL, and my talent was somewhat discovered. I didn't start as a writer editor. Um, I started as an admin three, but I was doing so many papers that people discovered that I had this useful, commodity and that I might share it with everybody. So I did get promoted as a writer and editor recently, not recently, a while ago. So the main content that I work with is I do a lot of our web pages. And the goal there, of course, is to create web pages that to the outside world are engaging and inspiring and even nudge people to call us and get in touch with us. So the other thing I am known for is um, I'm a grammar witch. I'm feared and loathed. And I write a grammar witch um, column for our RAL newsletter every month, usually dissecting some sort of grammar knit or communication issue. And I enjoy this quite a bit. And finally, where you come in, I'm a technical editor and I provide my resources not only to RHEL, but recently ASP asked me to um, provide my services to them. And I've been enjoying this very, very much. Your papers are extraordinary and I've been <laughs> incredibly impressed. So we're gonna move on to the next slide. What's my process? And the reason I tell you about my process is that although I don't read grants, um, grant reviewers have a process also, and I'm hoping that my process intersects with the kinds of things they're looking for. So this is going to be a bit of a piggyback to Stephen's slides, where he talks about relevance. And so my methodology is I go through the abstract and the introduction with probably the most attention that I'm going to apply to the entire paper. And the reason is I'm looking for the why. Why did you choose to pursue this? Is it um, personal curiosity? Did you identify a gap in the knowledge base that you sought to fill? Did you, did you see that your work will um, benefit society in some way. And I really appreciate statements that basically wrap it up for the audience. And don't assume that your audience is going to be a member of your particular specific scientific discipline. You never know who's going to read your paper. And that's the beauty of it. You want people who may be unconnected to your, to your science, to read it and say, I'm going to cite this because tangentially, it really works for my own argument. Who benefits? Um, will this have a human benefit? Do you perceive that something you have revealed or concluded may actually better society in some small way, may move the needle in global well-being. Okay, and now here is my, my list of raw nerves, nits, pet peeves. I believe that using an active voice, which is 
simple active voice. We did this. We, we concluded this is so much more powerful than using have, have been, um, because that just adds bulk um, and unnecessary bulk to your sentence. And it also, when you speak directly, it brings your confidence to the table. And confidence isn't arrogance. Confidence is purpose. That's what makes your readers lean in. And then moving on to one of the reasons I believe I was invited to this is I read papers not so much for grammatical errors because most of your papers don't have grammatical errors of any kind of import. I am helping you find the right word to make concise statements. And instead of cobbling together all these words in some past imperfect sentence it, it, it tense, I like to remove words, find the right word. And so one of my best friends was a writer for REI and for Backpacking Magazine. And she was educated at Northwestern with a journal, journal, <laughs> journalism degree. And she used to pound it into me. You don't need adjectives. You don't need adverbs if you chose the right verb and the right the right word in the first place so it just adds bloat um, and so my examples here are simple ones right instead of has try exhibits or shows or features or reveals the iceberg reveals several fissures conversely and this is also one of my pet peeves just make sure the word you're using isn't pretentious or inaccessible to any audience, a broader audience, because first of all, it makes you look a little pompous. And remember, if your peers are reading this, you don't want to imagine them rolling their eyes going, oh, use the word elucidate. Oh, great. Well, you know, you could just use the word explain because you really want to grease the wheels for someone to grasp your sentence without stumbling. So don't create speed bumps in the road to understanding. And just because you know a fancy word doesn't mean you should use it. Uh, for instance, utilize is one of my pet peeves. Utilize is to use in a special way. People use this word all of the time. I can't tell you how many times I go, don't you just mean use or employ or something else like extract? And so, for instance, utilize literally means to use in a special way. For instance, uh, I used a hammer to pound a nail. I utilized that hammer to prop my door open because that's not what the hammer was meant to do, but you used it in a special way. Hopefully that makes sense. And my last one is very, you don't need it. There are better words. And I'm gonna show you how to find a better word. So I don't know if you guys remember, and some of you may be too young for this. There was a movie called The Dead Poet Society. And Robin Williams, basically, it was a coming-of-age movie, and it inspired young men to be deeper, do better. And so his, his line was, avoid using the word very, because it's lazy. A man is not very tired. He is exhausted. Don't use very sad. Use morose. Language was invented for one reason, boys to woo women, and in that endeavor, laziness will not do. So I don't know if you guys have a chance to look at the grid on the right, but there are an infinite number of wonderful words to use instead of adding a very to something more modest. Tools, I believe in tools. I believe in cheating. 
I believe in copying. I believe in reading other people's work and saying, I'm going to use that in my paper. So one of these is called the Hemingway app, and we've used it a lot with our, word, our web pages because we want our web pages to be accessible, clean, engaging, and even exciting if there's an opportunity to do this. Anyway, if you see the quote there, the Hemingway editor is like a good editor, attuned to places where vanity seems to be getting the better of things. So this is the interface for the Hemingway app. And what you do is you switch to write. You paste in your verbiage. Let's just say a couple of paragraphs just for fun, just to kind of do a, uh, it's just a check. Oh, hang on a second. Apparently I copied something else. This is grabbed from a paper I read not too long ago. And then you hit edit. So what it's done is it created a scorecard over here to the right. So it gives you, you only use one adverb. Good for you because you've met the goal of one or fewer. Number two, uses of passive voice. Cut it to one or fewer. Number one, this phrase has a simpler alternative. Zero of seven sentences are hard to read, so good for you. You actually made this understandable. Oh, wait a minute. Six of seven, seven sentences are very hard to read. So if you click on each one of these, it'll actually give you specific advice about that word. Use a more forceful verb. So instead of negatively impacts, why not say damages or whatever? And then you can click on this. Bin wrong to use subsequent. All right. So that's the Hemingway app. And um, that'll be, of course, in my slides if you want to test it. It's a lot of fun to use. And again, we use it um, quite a bit for web pages because we really want our language to be almost beyond relatable, but even a little bit exciting. All right, so here we are back at my, my page. This is a fun tool. Lose the very. Once again, so let's say very. Delighted. Oh. How about <clears throat> low? Oh, sorry. Apparently they're not equipped. Grand, but maybe in this case you want large, enormous. Anyway, it's just, it's fun to play with. And um, I use a thesaurus pretty liberally. And I also have an archive of my articles. So if you ever want to review some of my content, some of it's entertaining, some of it will help you get your emails read better. Um, one of my greatest hits one is the did you read my email? Fewer words, this paragraph, obviously I clipped it for my presentation but it kind of underscores what I've already said. And this was an interesting gem that I found as I was, whoops, sorry, as I was looking for word choice things. The, the, U, the USGS actually went to some trouble to compile suggestions and warnings about words that would frequently appear in their literature. So can you see this, the choosing the right word? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. 
it goes through not only every word, it talks about the nuances of understanding each word. So about is nearly always better than approximate, but approximately is preferable if fairly accurate figures are given. And it goes through, I mean, this is pages and pages and pages of scientific language and jargon and how it may or may not be comprehended by your audience. It's worth a read. I actually learned quite a bit. Um, I found this yesterday and I'm still about only halfway through it and it recalibrated me on several scores. But I loved particularly this one quote. Whenever we come upon one of those intensely right words in a book or a newspaper, the resulting effect is physical as well as spiritual and electrically prompt. So I thought that was pretty cool. And this is my last slide. Because you guys wanted to see cute stuff, I quickly loaded up a cute picture of my husband and my puppy. And um, that's all I have. Thank you, Karen. That was a wonderful overview <laughs> of uh, very useful tips and tools uh, that we can use in our own work to uh, make sure that uh, our writing is consistent with the grammar and and not only the grammar but as you said the style and and how to elucidate our message in a concise way that makes it clear uh, so thank you so much for this overview um, before we switch to the uh, example statements and passing over to megan let me uh, to to mariana let me see whether i can uh, find yes there is a question for you karen um, which is, are there any resources you could share with those researchers that are not English native speakers to improve their writing? I'm going to give you an answer that isn't what you're hoping for. Um, I have noticed in reading many of the ASP postdoc papers that um, their papers are extraordinarily correct and extremely well written. I think, and this may be a, an unfair generalization, perhaps because they have studied a language in addition to their own and know things that we English speakers only know intuitively or organically. You know, we lope along, we English speakers, uh, you know, um, without checks and balances. But if you've had to learn a language and study it and study the terms for the language, knowing past imperfect and split infinitive and compound adjective hyphenation, I have only found tremendous superior writing skill amongst the ESL people. So I know that's not answering your question. Um, so my favorite line, when someone asks me something like that is, I don't know, I will find out. <laughs> so I'll let you know when I want something that I feel really worthy because I think you are all well beyond the basics. So I'll need to find something a little bit more robust. Yeah, I, I agree with you that uh, for us uh, non-native speakers, uh, high school education and learning a second language has been very heavy on the grammar and learning all about the technical structure of the language. And then I think me also as an example of a person who doesn't speak English as a uh, first language is, I think it's more to uh, our, the difficulty comes from our inability to see what is the trendy way to say things. What is the, the way that we should write it that's consistent with the status quo of technical language. So we understand the grammar, but maybe the choice of vocabulary is is the challenging aspect for us. And I think you provided some excellent resources here that we can lean on to decide which choice of words and statements makes most sense for a particular field. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Karen, for your presentation once mm -hmm. again. Uh, I would like to pass it here to Mariana briefly. Uh, she will uh, review some example statements before we go back, uh, go into our Q&A session afterwards. Yes, uh, thank you. So we have, uh, you know, when I say we, Huisto, Diamond, 
Anna and I, we have reached out to several project scientists and scientists at NCAR and asked who would be willing to share some example statements that were a part of a funded grant. So we have a curated document of seven example statements. And today we're just going to show one for the sake of time. And this is an example statement from for, for NOAA physical oceanography. And the topic was on buoyancy effects within plumes driven by rip currents. And their research approach was in situ and airborne observations of near shore plumes. So I'm just going to read the text on the screen and then point out why Christo, Anna, Diamond, and I were drawn to this as a nice example statement. So this work will improve predictions of material transport of pollutants, nutrients, heat, sediment, and larvae associated with rip currents and other nearshore processes by including important buoyancy effects which have previously been neglected. A postdoctoral researcher will be trained while performing modeling and data analysis for the project and will co-mentor an undergraduate student who will investigate the importance of nearshore plumes in modulating harm harmful algal blooms, assessing possible improvements to the California harmful algae, algae risk mapping, CHARM, systems in collaboration with its developers. The team will create an AGU session on oce oceanographic plumes across a range of scales, communicate with local and federal HAB forecasters, and prepare an outreach demonstration. This project provide, or, pardon me. This project provides a leadership opportunity to an early career principal investigator. So, the reason why this ex example stood out to us as like a nice, tangible, like okay, these are actual broader impacts and also um, points of inclusion is one. It directly states that a postdoc will be trained a part of this and will be a part of the mentoring process. So you have both postdoc learning skills, but then also an undergraduate student having a transfer of knowledge. There's also the point that this area has previously been neglected. So that shows the relevance of the research and the need of the research. And then towards the end, there's the discussion of, we're not just doing this research and keeping it to ourselves. We're creating a specific AGU session for this topic. And the last sentence I think is very applicable to all of us that this grant or probably this proposal is a leadership opportunity for an early career investigator. Okay, so with that, I believe we are on to Q&A. So in the slides, I'll put back here, um, pardon me, make sure we have everything. So the Slido link, let me see if somebody can paste that back in the chat because I know people have come in afterwards. Oh, here it is. Okay, so here's the Slido link that we'll be using. I'm gonna stop sharing real quick and then pass it over to Diamond who will be moderating the Slido. Yeah, um, so just based on what we just read for that um, example statement and also trying to combine a couple of the Slido questions together um, for the speakers today, um, what suggestions do you have about um, translating the work that we do into actionable science um, so either through outreach or ways that like local governments could use the outputs of um, maybe climate models or the observational data sets that we have um, so either from your experience or from maybe some um, statements that you've read or have participated in um, and I'll, I'll let you guys decide who wants to speak up first um but yeah just actionable uh, what what how can we do that i'll just say uh try to be specific and and have examples that actually have uh sort of a followable uh train of thought if you will uh, for example it's a much better to say that you're going to target specific groups or stakeholders or uh, populations specifically and that address specific uh, agencies that might be able to use things rather than just saying, you know, the classic example is I've done this research and I'm going to publish a paper and throw it over the fence and hope somebody uses it. So try to be as specific as possible. Specific as possible. Yeah, Megan or Karen, do you guys want to? 
add anything? Uh, Stephen beat me to it and said exactly what I, was on my mind. <laughs> um, yeah, specifics are great. I know that I'm also like this is just a snippet, and so like my brain is activated, and I have like a bunch of questions. I'm like, oh, I want to know this thing, that thing, and the other. And so I think if ever you're looking for a reader just to like review, especially from a very outsider point of view, I, I can volunteer as tribute. Um, but yeah, being being specific about communities or the potential community impact or or populations um, that could that could benefit from this information or assist in, in so yeah, specifics. And then if you if you have an idea of of a, a, a connection to additional research or how it would help elevate or support other things that are happening in that field, um, I could see that being a value add as well. I don't know that I have anything to say that wouldn't be redundant at this point. The truth of it is a lot of what we do, if you pull back and expand your resolution on any problem that we're solving, it will in fact have an effect on a human population. Because even if you're improving like a forecast tool, it's going to help more forecasters do their job better, which gives more warning to a population that might be at risk. So, you know, even when it looks like pure science and you're just moving the needle for a bunch of other scientists, the follow on effect is if you pull back on your, on your view, that effect is going to be employed in such a way that ultimately it will have an effect on the world well being. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I guess kind of building off of this thread, um, the next question I'll ask is for Steve, that first question um, that's on the list. Um, but kind of building it beyond just international projects, like what we're talking about right now with actionable science, um, how do you engage with um, these broader audiences ahead of time, like while you're writing the grant? proposal to make sure that what we think is actionable is actually actionable for these communities. Um, and so just, you know, what kind of experience do you have with that? Um, and then for these international projects, um, you know, knowing that they have different circumstances. Yeah, yeah, and here communication is really critical. Um, and knowing uh, the lay of the land, as I mentioned my proposal, I think is really important. 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 I mean, I did a big project in Argentina, uh, and I knew going into it there was a risk of doing sort of colonial science. Um, and so what I did is I went there, and I spent a lot of time there. I talked to people all the way from the highest levels of the government that I could engage all the way down to the local stakeholders. And I asked them what what would have the best impact here, um, and I tried not to bring my U.S. Uh, preconceptions as to what would be most most benefit most benefit most um, um, keep keep is uh, in terms of international stuff is that what me what is DEI somewhere else doesn't necessarily mean what DEI is here, right? And so you need to take that into account. And you may have different sort of, I don't know what the right word is, but when you're talking to a funding agency here, it's different than trying to motivate people in another country. And so so you have to kind of keep that in mind and loosen up your ideas of what you might want to do. Yeah, Megan or Karen, did you yeah. want to add anything to that? Nothing yeah. that wouldn't be redundant. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, understanding like another another country's like socio political and historical context is is only going to add add richness and depth to the work that you're trying to do, um, and provide you that context for knowing which direction to go and who are my best resources um, and partners. So. Yeah, and I I guess I would also add that um it doesn't even have to be international, right? Like even within what we call the United States. I mean, I'm here in Hawaii. So, you know, for my people, um, for, 
for my culture, it's it's very different in terms of how um, scientists engage with our community. Um, and we have um, cultural protocols that um, a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, and so a lot of times, yeah, it, it, it gets really tricky. Um, we'll ask a fun question, and I don't know if um, every all the panelists um, are into soccer. Um, I don't know anything, <laughs> um, but there was a question for Megan of who who do you think is going to win the World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I also I plugged in a, a reply for the men's World Cup that's happening or about to happen soon. Um, Y'all, I don't know. I, I'm hoping for France. I'm a really big Mbappe fan. I'm, I'm thinking France, but like, who knows? I, I'm, I'm mostly for men's soccer. I'm just a spectator. I'm here to enjoy and see what happens. I have a lot stronger feelings and opinions on the women's game. Um, I'm very nervous about the U.S. women's national team um, in terms of the the overall team's health and wellness and and coaching decisions and. I could go on and on. A podcast recommendation, if you want to learn more about soccer or just like be in, in the conversation in a passive way, um, Men in Blazers, A plus uh, podcast, if you wanna know more about women's soccer, especially from a global, like including a US context, but also a global perspective that's centered on um, black women and women of color. Uh, Diaspora United, I'll put them in the chat. I see Stephen waving. Here's my answer. Here's my answer. Here's my answer. <laughs> Anna, you had a question, uh, perhaps? No, or? I was going to comment on Spain, like because we have the Football Club Barcelona players that are up there. So <laughs> women, women there are like pretty crushing it. So nice. Well, there's um, the next question I think is pretty good um, to get us to wrap up for a closing remarks. Um, if there's any um, advice that you could give in one minute um, for each of you um, to early career scientists um, who are writing a broader impact or DEI statement for the very first time, um, what, what, where do you suggest we start? Um, how do we start writing? Who do we start talking to? Um, anything like that. So if you could give us like a one minute closing remark on that, um, that would be great. We'll start with Steven. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I would say talk talk to your peers and your mentors. Um, they're really going to provide examples for you, help you skew, help you skew, help you try, try and, build, um, and try to make it, um, you know, get feedback from them so that it can be the best part of your project that it can be. Um, and, uh, and, and really just, you know, be creative. I, I think the reviewers really are looking for something that's novel. And, uh, and so, so be, be creative. Thanks, Megan. Don't be afraid to ask other people who might be outside of your your scope of research um, for feedback and and just to get a different perspective of like as, is what I'm saying making sense to somebody who's outside of of this field um, because you're already going to get great feedback from those that are inside your 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 networks um, but don't be afraid to to go outside of your circle to get some some feedback and you know, kudos and praise too. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And then Karen. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to speak to this as specifically as you'd like, but I really believe that both Megan and Stephen had really great suggestions in that let me explain where I'm going with this. I'm not framing this very succinctly. When I first started doing scientific technical editing, I worried that I wouldn't understand the science. And so what I did was I made friends with someone who could translate for me. So I said, translate this science to me. Invariably, what they did was 
they made it accessible to me, a lay person. If you can take your statement, your paragraph, hand it to someone, like Megan said, not specifically in your field or even in your field and say, explain it to me like I'm in eighth grade. You will have something that hopefully people will say, aha, I get it. That's amazing. I love where you're going. The second side of it is I like the idea of even using words like novel approach. When I see that in a paper, I'm like, ooh, this is new. Now I'm excited. Now I lean in. So find a way to present yourself as being fresh. That's all I got to say. Nice. Thank you. Also, one day I hope to have a really cool title like Grammar Witch. <laughs> that would be so cool. I don't wish. Uh, I am universally loathed and people uh, live in mortal fear of sending an email to me that I will turn it back and say, that's I, not me. Or lie, not lay. Lie, not <laughs> Should pity my husband. Um, okay, so with that, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, the recording for this session um, and the example statements will be available to you all soon. Um, thank your emails. Um, and again, just as a reminder, uh, we will have the next session sometime in January, and that topic is Convergent Science. Um, so hopefully we'll see you either at AGU or AMS, um, and that hope that you all have um, some time off during the holidays. Um, so yeah, with that, um, thanks for coming, everyone, uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>